It's our Monday podcast here at the Rigger. Ryan Russillo with Chris Long every Monday, and he's whistling old school tunes. Uh, we're yeah. going to talk about whistling a little bit later. Yeah, like the whistle. It's hard in the winter. It's a little bit dry. Whistling in the winter. Underrated. Today's episode of the Ryan Russillo Show is brought to you by State Farm. If you're fumbling with insurance, State Farm agents are here to help because with over 19,000 agents, they're local to you and available to help. Whether you connect in person, by phone, or through the State Farm mobile app, agents are here to help. So go with the one that has coverage and agents that you can count on. Here's the hit list for today. Headlines. I think Lamar is mine. I'm sure um, I already know what Chris is, so I'll just save it because I I don't want to ruin it for anybody. Um, Lamar MVP. We'll do some of that stuff. Uh, Also, New England's win against Philadelphia. We've got best plane rides, as always. Kaepernick stuff. Miles Garrett story from last week. The new Razor is coming out, not an endorsement, but Chris and I may be all in, and a little Nick Cage apparently today, and we should talk hoops, because when you think of rivalries, you think of Virginia and Vermont, and they're playing yeah. each other, so we should probably Ooh. bet on that. Yeah, yeah, we should. I'll, t- I'll do my entire ringer paycheck. I will not. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll take the under, too, if you watch Virginia lately. Yes, the under might might be the play there. So uh, we'll, yeah. we'll see. We'll see what we can come up with uh, a little bit later. Okay, let's um, let's start with your headline. Why don't you go first? Ooh, well, you know it's 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 Captain Kirk related, baby. I gotta. Hey, listen, I'm gonna will this take to work. I mean, <laughs> you, you know, I've been on the Captain Kirk train all year long. I hopped off for one weekend after that Chicago rock bottom game, but I'm back on my man. You know. Ha- He's looking down the barrel of becoming the 100th team in the last five years, I think it was, uh, to lose a game down 20 points at the half. I mean, they spot Denver a bunch of points in a game that, by the way, I think they were 10.5-point favorites. I wasn't so sure about that, uh, even at home, because they're coming off that big win at Dallas on a Sunday night. Those short weeks are tougher. But they spotted 20 to a team that has lost four fourth quarter leads this year. And you kind of are keeping your eye on it. And you're like, maybe, maybe. And they end up coming back and winning. And it comes down to the final play. Uh, it was a lot of fun to watch. He's gone on a tear since that game I mentioned against the, uh, against the bears. They're six and one. They had a three point loss at Arrowhead. That's pretty respectable. And I think as, as we go through the season, um, you know, Kirk's going to reel off some more wins and we're going to have this cognitive dissonance where we're like, but this isn't the Kirk who we know and love. And that's the guy that, that throws games away and, and, and throws picks and, and shrinks in big moments. Lately, he hasn't been that guy. And listen, they're going to the bye this weekend, you know, three losses on the year, one behind green Bay in that divisional race. They're going to have a real big opportunity, and this is the tailor-made game for Kirk to finally change the entire narrative. It hasn't happened yet. Even in this six-and-one stretch, they haven't exactly been playing kick-ass defenses, but they're going to go to Seattle, and not a good defense up there, but if he can outduel uh, Russell in that really loud, tough place to play, they're going to not only have a, a chance to win the division, and of course all eyes will be on that Green Bay-Minnesota uh, matchup in December in Minnesota, but he will go a long way towards shedding that bad reputation he's got. I got to be honest. I was doing my thing. They're down 23-3. I'm like, oh, here we go. Here we go. Do you know him or something? I just, I feel like you are very defensive of him. Well, maybe you're right. Well, I'm just anti, like, I just think like when you enter the meme portal, as we've we've coined it, (laughs) um, and he, and he's been in the meme portal for some time. We have a hard time, I think we just have a hard time allowing people out of that portal. And I don't think it helps that he's making a bunch of money, so people resent the money thing. They resent his lack of personality. He's he's certainly kind of the stereotypical, prototypical quarterback that gets paid off of, you know, the way he looks and uh, (laughs) some of his his talents but can't quite put it together from a decision-making and clutch standpoint. Well, this year he's kind of been better that way. And if you take that Bears game away, uh, it's been a big improvement. So we we talked about Kubiak coming in. We talked about Dalvin being healthy. We talked about Stefanski, the the zone run, the the getting him on the edge. You know, he 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 threw really well moving the pocket yesterday, too. And he's doing this without Thielen. They don't target Diggs once in the first half. 
And then he goes five for 121 in the second half. I mean, this was the crossroads. You were like exactly what you said. I think millions of people were looking at that score because not many people were watching it unless you're a Vikings or a Denver fan. And they're going, yep, Kirk's Kirkin again. And then they engineer that comeback. Uh, so really all eyes from here is, it, you know, if you're skeptical, I don't blame you yet, but give him his credit for what he's done so far. Don't be a hater. He's had a good year. And uh, if he goes up and beats Seattle in Seattle, I think that we can kind of postpone and, and pull him out of the meme portal. Okay, I I would say if he goes and beats Seattle at Seattle, um, that's that's doing something. And by the way, looking yeah. at this playoff stuff, I think you just did an all eyes on me shout out real quick. Do you think there could be a hoodie with Cousins' face on it and it says all eyes on me, Tupac graphic? Oh, yeah, I think it'd be great. Yeah. i buy it. Yeah, you would buy that. Um, the way the seating is that. right now in the NFC, and this is ridiculous how deep the top is. San Francisco's the one. Green Bay's got the tiebreaker over New Orleans, so those are your buy teams. New Orleans would play the six-seed Vikings. The Vikings are a six-seed at eight and three. Dallas is six and four, and Seattle's your five-seed. So five of the six teams in the NFC have eight or more wins, and the six-seed, yeah, look, the, the AFC is six, four, six, four, seven, three, Bills, six and four, so... Um, we we knew this. We knew the NFC was better. We've always had a hard time trying to figure out who that third best AFC team is at different times. And then when you start looking at like the, some of the strength, the victory stuff, you can go, well, San Francisco's schedule hasn't been that tough. Green Bay's has been tougher, but Dallas basically doesn't beat anybody that's good. Well, um, Dallas doesn't beat anybody out of division. It was crazy. I saw a stat recently. It was like fourteen and four or something in division the past three years, and then they're like sub five hundred out of division. Like it's 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 mind boggling. Yeah, their wins are the Giants, Redskins, Dolphins when they were 3-0 and and everybody was like, okay, Dax to win MVP. Um, not everybody, but you know what I'm saying. Then they lose to the Saints. They couldn't score. Will Kane is going to do the Cowboys today. I saw the rundown on his radio show. He's got um, to. My dog has to. Have a they day. beat the Eagles. Yeah, they beat the Eagles, so I guess, I don't know. I mean, do we look at that and say, hey, that's a really good win? Well, they housed him. It was 37-10, so maybe one good win in there. But I'm just going through and making the point no, that— No, because they, they've you, been beating the Eagles for three years now, and it hasn't <laughs> yielded— I mean, seriously, I looked up at one point, and somebody was like, hey, you never beat you never beat a Zeke-healthy uh, Cowboys team, and I didn't while I was there. I mean, it's, like, it's crazy to think about that. The Eagles have not beaten a team with Zeke healthy. Did you have to go up against Tyron? Yeah, but like largely, okay, so when Tyron came in the in the league, he was playing right tackle. And I remember playing him and thinking like, ah, his anchor's not great. He's got really good feet. He's more of a finesse tackle at right. But, you know, different players thrive well on different sides. And like for me, I'm I'm kind of left-handed over on the right in a bad way. And when I go over there on the right and play him, it's like I I, I got no shot. I mean, this guy is... I would say when he's healthy, he's the best in my time in the league at tackle that I've seen. I mean, he just puts it all together, the technique, the feet, the anchor, uh, the nastiness. He's got enough of that. He's like Debo over there, man. Like when, when he speaks, I think those guys listen, and, and he's a big part of the tone they set up front. I do I, – I think this is funny because it's, it's like – it's kind of simplistic, and it may sound stupid here, but I just was thinking about – different ideas for the podcast today and one of the things i was thinking about was like just how you dudes look at each other especially when it's that edge tackle thing and it's yeah. like hey what's going on like i'm gonna line up and run into your body 70 times today over the next three plus hours and yeah you know i hope i get you once you know obviously you want to get more than that but there has to be some sort of thing where you guys look at each other and i'm not just talking athlete to athlete because i've seen that enough but specific to edge guy tackle there's oh, like sure. a ton of respect that you guys have for each other because of how ridiculous that it's just a straight up one-on-one -on -one battle basically the whole game and that and it is one of the most i mean if you play sides and i played left end for most of my career uh you know you do like you don't go away and, and if you're a corner you might not travel with the best player you might not be matched up with one player the whole game etc um, that's a very intimate matchup. And it's funny because you, you, you'll see the guy before the game, like coin toss maybe, or across the sideline. And yeah, it's like, uh, shit's about to go down. I mean, this is a, this is a very personal matchup. And the thing for alignment is that they always complain about is, well, you know, if we get beat once, we had a bad game. Uh, well, you get beat a lot of other times too, and their pressures and hits. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, I don't feel bad for those guys that get paid a shit ton of money. 
and they're generally bigger and just as athletic as the as the DNs. I think uh, I think that whole cliche that you know you got to block the most athletic guy on the field. Well, these guys are three thirty and they 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 move they run like run like a deer. Like in Tyron's case, I bet he could beat me in a forty. How much would you hate playing tackle? Oh, I would absolutely hate it, especially at this age. If I had to start over, you know, it's funny how some guys, they're like at the end of their career, like I'll go try guard to extend my career. Or I'll go, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, a tight end could could turn into a tackle or a tackle could turn into a tight end. There is zero chance a defensive lineman could go play offensive tackle late in their career. I just don't believe, I, I can't think of enough uh, instances where somebody made the switch and made it work. It is one of the most difficult jobs on the field. Yeah, no, no doubt. All right, my headline, Lamar Jackson is going to win the MVP. They destroyed Houston in a game where I was so excited because I'm like, here we go, like two, two of the guys that are firmly in the MVP conversation with Russell Wilson, and they beat him 41-7. And it was, you know, I'm not going to say, hey, then the score was even worse and try to add um, some context to it. If you watch the game, it was over. It was over quick. And you're like, all right, Lamar's hit this guy. All right, he's got Andrews again. Okay, here we go, 14 nothing. And you're like, it just kept going. And even though I feel like Russell Wilson has been, if I'm just going by TV shows, radio stuff, Twitter, and looking at who's talked about the most as MVP, um, you know, Lamar has been in the conversation, but I think he's always been behind Russell Wilson. And, you know, maybe I begrudgingly keep Deshaun up there. Uh, and I don't want to, I don't like doing this stuff where it's like, hey, how could you possibly say, like, if I were on a TV show today and they were like, give us your top three. And if I put Deshaun down there, everybody would look at me like an idiot because they just got housed by the Ravens. But, Lamar but goes. They got Lamar. They got Lamar up there off of one week. I mean, Lamar's done it all year, but we're being very reactive and moving him ahead of of Russ off one week. I did it all this morning. Mm-hmm. I broke it down. I don't think I'm being reactive. I'm going to break it no, down. No, no, I'm right not now. saying that. But I'm saying if you frame that, no, step if you, off. If you, yeah, if you <laughs> if you frame the Deshaun Watson thing as like you know, hey, that's bullshit because he lost yesterday. Then you got to do it the other way too. And and that was a that was a great performance by by Lamar, no doubt. S- so throughout the year, as as we've sat here and just consumed all the Lamar stuff, going like, what else? What else can we do? And I know I was guilty of after a few weeks being like, I'm not sure the Kansas City game, how they defended him. I've always thought, and it's just look, it's history that the dual threat guys, there seems to always be a correction on him at some point in their career. And with him right now, he's leading the number one scoring offense. Okay. They are the two seed at eight and two. They beat New England. He has, with his 19 passing touchdowns, he's got six more rushing TDs. So he's 19 and five. So Russ is a 23 touchdown, two interception split. He's got three rushing touchdowns, so 26 for him. And I'm not just going like, hey, total touchdowns here. Lamar, though, has got 25. One of the things that I was talking about before when I, when I watched some of the games, like again, Pittsburgh left a bad taste in my mouth. Kansas City, they made it kind of close, but I didn't think it really happened. And then really what he did is he beat New England running um, mm-hmm. excuse me, I shouldn't say that. The team beat New England running. Um, yeah. and that's that's what they've been doing here. Where even if he's and I looked at some of these numbers, um, the defense is getting a little bit better. They're middle of the pack in DVOA, they're middle of the pack yards allowed, they're seventh in points allowed, but they're you know, look, they're an eight and two football team that's the number one scoring offense in the league. And he has stats that if you're just going to tell me Russell Wilson's touchdown interception split is better, I'd be like, well, then we're looking at a guy in Lamar who's going to break the record for rushing yards by a quarterback. He's on pace for 1,200 yards. So even if you're sitting there going, well, his passing yards per game, that's, that's just not the point. Like you don't you don't need yeah. to pass a ton yesterday. And I saw somebody, I and again, I forget, I'm not trying to be dismissive, but somebody had him ninth and it had to have been only to get a reaction because that's his insane. passing yards are down. And you're just like, no, like, and don't forget, the way voters are, voters love a story. It happens yeah. all the time in the NBA. The NFL is a little more frustrating because it's basically just one position seems to ever win it, which is annoying. But I think Lamar is going to win the MVP if he keeps this going. Well, I, I I wouldn't have any qualms if he did win the MVP. I think at this point it's Russ or Lamar and anybody getting mad at the other person about an MVP pick out of those two guys, you're just being ridiculous. Uh, I I think... With Lamar, you look at it, they're, they have two losses. They're, they're bad losses, and, and I kind of went through a power rankings exercise in my head this morning, and I have Baltimore one because their two, their two losses morning. are so – yeah, their two losses are so far back, and one of them was really pretty respectable. I mean, the Cleveland one's a head-scratcher, but um, he has kind of 
Now they've built around him, but he has repurposed a lot of pieces and made, I mean, like one of the drives yesterday, I think he's going to, Lamar Jackson is going to bring world peace. I mean, he, he, he hit every white guy eligible to, to catch a pass in the NFL on one of his touchdown drives yesterday. I'm like, they have three tight ends that all look like blocking guys. He's hitting fullbacks out of the backfield. He's hitting different receivers. Uh, that marriage between him and Greg Roman, defenses don't know what to get into. You know, you got three tight ends on the field. You think they're probably running the football. They can still spread you out and hit all those guys in the pass game. And you mentioned the defense. Uh, Marcus Peters might be the second most important guy on that team for sure. I mean, since he showed up, they've faced Wilson, Brady, and Watson. And since the trade, highest pressure rate in the league, second lowest passer rating uh, for a po- opposing quarterback. So they're doing it now defensively. It's pretty scary. Uh, Judon had a big game yesterday. I really like him. But Lamar might have started slow in, in a really big matchup, and he finished – with with pinpoint accuracy and and uh, on the other end of it, if you're Houston, you know that if you're a contender, you're thinking you're probably going to have to go through them again. I don't feel very good about the matchup. I don't think it's it's an anomaly. They just got their ass kicked and and uh, six sacks um, on the other end is bad. It looked like the Deshaun Watson stuff of old where they couldn't protect him. But I would also say he was processing a little bit slower and some of those were long shot clock sacks. So. Um, not a good matchup for Houston if they see him again. Okay, so those are our headlines. Let's go plane rides here. Best plane ride. Ooh, my best plane ride is probably going to be the Atlanta Falcons, right? Because uh, they went on the, the road, red right? hot, the red hot the red Atlanta hot Falcons, Falcons. You mean? Yeah, dude. Here's here's the thing about the Falcons: short flight, division win, coming off of two division wins. Your coach is in a really good mood, probably because he was dead in the water a month ago, and. The interesting thing with the Falcons is how they reshuffled the staff. I think I heard that they picked names out of a cap to, like, see who was going to <laughs> coach what position. What? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the rumor. It was that. It was, like, that random. And Raheem Morris moves to defensive backfield, uh, coaching those guys, and takes, like, 50% of the play-calling duties. So for Dan Quinn to hand over the play-calling uh, duties and for the defense to play a lot better, in the last uh, in the last ten quarters, they've given up fifteen points and zero touchdowns. So that's a that's a coach that from Legion of Boom era is supposed to be defensive ball coach. They've never been good on defense. He is really likable, and p- players will play hard for him. So I think he's got a shot at saving his job. I think everybody's ecstatic on that flight home. Short flight, you can get out in the streets in Atlanta, Magic City. <laughs> there, right now, you're sneaky. 13 seed do position coaches matter oh absolutely and position coaches are there's a lot of bad ones position coaches that's a big fake it till you make it thing like break it down for me because i I didn't like asking the question that way because i knew the answer is yes but i always find it fascinating when i'll hear certain things where guys will be like this dude is a fraud (laughs) oh yeah i mean there's a lot of them out there and there's a lot of fraud players out there too but the difference is that fraud players when they when they don't play well they don't just keep getting jobs and coaches <laughs> continue to get jobs because they look out for each other in an NFL locker room in an NFL building if players complain about coaches downstairs it's a big fucking deal an NFL coach's job is to go upstairs and complain about players all day long so it's not only a huge sensitive double standard that they can't be critiqued ever by players and we're supposed to be coworkers A lot of them didn't even play the position that you play in the NFL that they're coaching. But additionally, it's like you can really fake it till you make it. And and you assume that when players get in the NFL, they're going to be developed like the best and brightest. Um, They're not. And and that's the biggest assumption that people fall short on is that players are automatically going to improve because they have the best coaches in the world. They just don't. And uh, and yeah, I mean – position coaches matter and not enough of them played and even the ones that played sometimes rest on the fact that they played and they can kind of relax and wing it so it's a really inexact imperfect science okay little uh little sidetrack there and i i did that but uh yeah i uh, i love the position coach stories that i get to hear yeah but it's interesting because atlanta shuffled them i mean like what the hell yeah, that, that actually blows my mind that you would sit there. But then again, you know, you go, hey, if you coach corners, does that mean you can't coach receivers? 
Like, I don't know. I imagine for some guys, yeah, like, hey, I've never coached on the offensive side of the football. I shouldn't be doing it. And I would think that there's other people that are great because they're well-rounded and they've coached a bunch of positions. And, you know, when you probably are aligned with a position, it, it helps you, you know, if you've never co coached the old line, but you're calling plays, like that might be a huge problem. You know, you guys bounce around in the league. Guys coach different positions. The good ones can coach different positions. Um, and if you look at a lot of coordinators and head coaches history, if you go on like their Wikipedia, it's like three pages long and they've coached five different positions. So they can do it, uh, but there's not enough good coaches. There's just not. And the, the schedule sucks. So like what former player who knows a ton about football wants to then go back to it? I mean, a lot of them do because you can't quit the game or you really love it or you like coaching. But there's a lot of guys that are like, fuck this. I don't want to never see my family be at the mercy of getting fired and moved and, you know, getting told what to do and, you know, late hours, early mornings. Like, I just worked my ass off for a decade to make a bunch of money. I don't have to work anymore. So what you get is you don't always get the best and the brightest. Yeah, that's always something I think is really important when we talk about hiring as coaches and, and head coaches. I just think guys make so much money now and have made so much money. And I, I run into more people. I mean, you know it better than I do, but there's a lot of guys that play. They're like, I don't want to do that. The NBA is yeah. different, I think, because you're staying at the five star hotels. You're you're you've lived yeah. your whole <laughs> life on the road. You know, like a lot of those guys yeah. just hire buddies of theirs from former teams. And, you know, some of these NBA staffs are like seven, nine deep. It's it's nuts. They, and, they got like roll, roll dogs. They just hire dudes to just roll with them. I mean, good, look, the guys played, you know, it, it rarely. Yeah. You know, as we were joking around, if you played again and if I could just be your dude, be like, hey, yeah. you know, Chris has got a guy with him. It's yeah. This Rosillo guy. He's just. Well, they got that in the pros too. They got package deals and, and guys bring their staffs over. And the, and the funny thing is how, how in, it's not a business when you're dealing with players, right? Cut one, fire one, trade one, whatever. The minute you got to fire a friend, coaches look real funny. They look yeah. real different. And players do it too. Players stick up for each other unnecessarily on topics and issues. But players don't dictate each other's employment status. So that's the biggest difference. And and coaches hold a lot of power in not firing or bringing their friends on. So, yeah, it's it's, it's it can be kind of a shit show. And that's not to assume that players can can coach better than guys who never played. But you are you are losing out on a big part of the population that could be pretty competent because they're like, I don't want to deal with this. I don't have to. Yeah, no, no doubt. Right. Because, you know, guys that would come by ESPN that would retire, you know, Canell and I would talk to them like, hey, do you want to coach ever? And they'd be like, no way. I'm like, I don't want to do Why? that. Why? Yeah. And then you're like, oh, wow. Okay. And it was just amazing how often it would happen. Like, that was always the same response. It wasn't all yeah. these ex players begging to become coaches. It was all the. But again, you know, if you were coming by ESPN, you're probably a pretty big name. You probably made a lot of money. And you're not a guy that, you know, played four or five years and is grinding, thinking about, all right, how am I going to make money after 26 years old? So, and to your um, point, there's also a threat there for guys that didn't make as much money and really want to get into the coaching. I've seen this players have a hard time breaking in because a lot of times coaches are protective of that brotherhood because you start letting a bunch of players in. What's your leg to stand on if the, if the player has experience and can coach as well as you and the connection to the players, like you're going to have former players left and right. So I feel like former players have to work even harder in some locker rooms. And coaching really interesting. Yeah. 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 I, I've, I've never really thought of that. That's why I always thought it was kind of funny, like how, how difficult it is. Like, especially when you're like a tough guy routine where you're like, Hey, I'm going to be the tough guy. And then you're like, yeah, but you're trying to be a tough guy in front of like 270 pound guys. Like everybody, yeah. you know what I mean? That that's doesn't why, play. Is it, a ha is that happening less? It feels like it's happening less with coaches. It has to happen less because guys are like <laughs> at a certain point and, and fans will call you soft. Anytime players who make millions of dollars want autonomy or like a little bit more power fans hate when millionaires ask for more autonomy but not getting demeaned and screamed at in front of like a hundred other adults is something that regular people are afforded most at most jobs you're not going to be told some of the heinous things i've heard coaches say to players like heinous shit like that i'm not going to be vulgar on here or like sensationalist, but I've heard some things that like, I'll, f I'll fucking fight you. Like, you know what I mean? Like you can't say that. And you'll hear him say it to a rookie who has no power and they don't, you know, coaches pick their spots. And we've talked about this before, but yeah, I mean, that stuff's got to go. That stuff's starting to go by the wayside because of the transparency factor and the factor of like, okay, now we're all coworkers. It's not like the sixties where you could just scream at a guy and own him. Sneaky, good plane ride. The jets. Yeah. 
first road win of the year. Yeah, and, and they look good. I thought that was – if you didn't take the Jets yesterday, you were stupid, and that includes me because I stared at it, and I was like, ah, I like the Jets. I'm not. I'm afraid. The Redskins are a dumpster fire. Um, and they just continue to one-up themselves. Three sacks for uh, for Jamal Adams yesterday. Okay, worst plane ride. This one's easy. Yeah, for me, wh- who's it for you? It's the same. It has to be Chicago. It's Chicago. Yeah, it's Chicago. And by the way, the Rams aren't much happier. Uh, no, no, I'm, you know, but it's, it's a real quick commute up there. I don't know if you've seen how close the stadium is to LAX. Um, no, no, I got, people- I got you. Some people have, if you look on Twitter, I'm sure you can find maybe somebody I believe is taking a picture of the stadium, the new stadium. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen some aerial shots. Evidently, there's going to be a stadium there, which by the way, in LA, and I liken it to an ADD teenager or like a three-year-old, like you need a shiny object to get fans to go to football games and that's offense, not defense. And that's where we are right now. So not to, but my point is that when I looked at last night, it's not even about who won that game because neither team is going places this year, in my opinion. Um, it's more about which coach was going to like implode under the pressure because both of them are under a lot of pressure right now. And the Trubisky benching in the fourth, I think it was. Yeah, in the fourth. It was it was a terrible look. If if it That doesn't look like a conversation where you're telling a guy like, hey, we're going to shut you down, your hips hurt. It, it didn't. No, and that's what everybody's going with today. Well, I, I wouldn't say everyone, but it, it felt like, look, if Mitch is playing better, he's not getting pulled because of the hip thing. But, you know, I'm going to headline up right now and be like, hip injury worsens, has to leave game. When we were kidding about the meme portal, whatever it is, that's Chicago is fully in it. Like Chicago is becoming this weekly national disaster. Or yeah. do I just have a lot of friends who are from Chicago and root for the Bears? I don't know. I, I don't know. I feel like the Chicago thing when they're bad it's way extra now compared to just other bad teams. Well, that's one of those markets like a Philly, Chicago, New York market, those major markets. Fortunately for LA, there's not as much passion. They don't, I'm not saying there's not passionate fans. I know there's a lot of Rams fans who, who dislike, you know, St. Louis players. And there's, there's a weird dynamic there. Um, But you know, the big markets, Chicago's is as tough as any to lose in, I would think. And they're, they're just finding new ways to do it every week. And the Trubisky thing, you know, I've seen the Godfather memes, the Game of Thrones memes, like the hug, you know, the embrace before, you know, Danny gets stabbed with the dragon glass or whatever it was. Uh, it, you know, like, I feel bad for Trubisky, man. I felt bad for him for some time. And listen, it's hard to feel bad for somebody, again, that's making a bunch of money and et cetera. But this is what playing in a league is, is like, there's a very human element that gets exposed. You getting benched on prime time in front of millions and millions of people. You know, you've got to have that conversation in front of the world. If that's what the conversation was, that was super awkward and and, and not cool of Nagy. And and that flight was probably pretty shitty and a long one. Yeah, no, no, no doubt on that one. Um, let's do uh, let's do a little Kaepernick here. Because, yeah. you know, it's obviously very newsworthy. It's been all over the last couple of days. Um, and it started when we heard last week that Kaepernick was going to have a workout with the NFL. But the NFL was setting it up. I could tell immediately from Kaepernick's tweet that he was letting people know that this isn't exactly being handled the right way. I thought when he said, I'm just getting word from my representatives that the NFL league office reached out to them about a workout in Atlanta on Saturday. I've been in shape and ready for three years. Can't wait to see the head coaches and GMs on Saturday. So I thought it was like positive, but I thought that first line was cryptic. That it's like, hey, just finding this out. And, you know, I did a little digging and was asking people like, what is going on with this? And from the sounds of it, Chris, teams did want to work them out, but they wanted the cover of it being an NFL thing. Um, and you know, th- then there's the Jay-Z element where it's like, did Jay-Z get him the workout with Roger Goodell and all this kind of stuff? Well, Whatever it was, even if the NFL hates Colin Kaepernick, they they could have handled this a lot better. But then it spins to what actually happened? What were these negotiations? Did Kaepernick's team, hours before the Saturday workout, demand all of these things to be changed? Then the workout actually changes locations. So the whole thing ends up becoming kind of a debacle. With the NFL, I can't imagine like, hey, look, everybody thinks you're the bad guy here. Um, in, in on the Kaepernick side of this, right? Not everybody collectively yeah. is NFL fans, but the Kaepernick side of this is is fully convinced that it's collusion and you're blackballing this guy and all these different things. Even if those things say were true, 
and you believe that and you couldn't, you just despise Kaepernick, execute this with better clarity and make it like, just make it an easy workout, make it something yeah. easy for him to do. Like hook, make it, pretend for, for God's sakes, you know, give the illusion that you actually don't want this to be a debacle. But then I'll admit that as I felt that throughout the week, then once all the details came out and everything was changed and all the different controversies from it, and then listening to Kaepernick speak and after the fact that, you know, really the way teams are on this is they hate distractions. They didn't want a distraction. And for me, Kaepernick just convinced the rest of the league that he will be nothing but a massive distraction if you sign him with what he ended up doing at the end of that workout. So I have more on that, but I've gone too long. So I just wanted to set it all up and have you jump in. No, I mean, listen, um, I'm pro cap. I've been pro cap from the beginning. And I think we've gotten to this point where if there's any nuance in your pro cap take, you can just be, you know, voted out, you know, voted off the island. Um, and I haven't always agreed with all his tactics, but I also, in a situation like this, and there's been a number of people who have been very critical of these specific tactics. I think the people who are leading with criticisms of cap here and how would I have handled it? I have no idea. I never got my employment taken away from me for three years. You know, like I, I never got fucked that bad. Um, and I, my middle name is spite. Like that's, I'm a very spiteful person. So I can certainly identify with him being spiteful. Um, but if the NFL was playing a PR game, he gave them the game. And I hate that because I want him back in the league. He deserves to be back in the league. Um, you know, you should frame this entire thing is all I'm saying. If you're going to be, if you're leading with criticisms of cap as it should be framed correctly, which is that this should, he should never be having to jump through these hoops, period. The reason this is going on is because he was blackballed. On, on whatever level, wh whatever the threshold for being blackballed is, like, you could argue it's half the teams, it's three teams, collusion, like, whatever. He has been denied employment by multiple teams based on his political or stance on police brutality and the like. But even if you disagree with all that stuff, you can't argue with his competency. And yet here we are three years later, and he's having to ace the PR thing. He's having to ace, you know, what some people would call a misstep in moving the workout or not just going and throwing and ignoring the waiver, ignoring the media request, taking the receivers that they provide. He's having to ace all this and get a hundred on this test. And the test shouldn't even be having to be taken. I mean, so that's my thing is I could disagree with, Hey, listen, he could have been more level-headed or just played ball, like whatever. We shouldn't even be having to make that decision. And the context of the NFL, I mean, they have a black belt in PR disasters. They are like, is there a higher belt than black belt? I was asking on my pod, is that the highest karate belt? You know what? I'm going to get the IT team on this because um, if it's, I don't know if it's a brown belt or a black belt or, you know, a red belt, but they have that belt. They, they are, they are, they are a PR disaster machine at this point. Have you ever and, wanted to be a black belt, by the way? No, I was a yellow belt. I had a karate instructor when I was a kid that um, I, I did like four lessons and I quit. <laughs> um, but I remember one time there was a rattlesnake outside. This is no BS. And he took me out there and he was karate kicking at the rattlesnake and stuff. I, I thought that was pretty ill-advised. Wow. Uh, Fu Fukuda was just awarded, well, not just, um, this was 2011, August 2011, for those keeping track. Fukuda was just awarded the 10th degree black belt, judo's highest level, and an honor that was been granted only to a handful of men worldwide and never before to a woman. She was 90. So, oh, this is different. I'm, I'm combining shout out headlines. To shout out to Fukuda. Um, so I would, say, I would say that. She was 98. Listen, I don't. Th there's no uh, reason you do this if, you, if you're the NFL, if you're trying. Like all you've done here is you've, you've alienated people on both sides of the argument. You've definitely pissed pro-cap people off, and you have angered a bunch of red-blooded Americans, Americans um, that don't want to watch your product because you even opened the door for Cap to come back in and hold this workout for them. The waiver thing is relevant. The team's being, you know, worried about having him come into the building because of, aka, well, distractions, throngs of people descending upon their facility while they're trying to win games. And also the threat of a second collusion case. 
you know, some people would say that them going to the NFL is evidence that there is collusion, you know, having to run this through the NFL. And the NFL throws together this sloppy, shitty spectacle, uh, and Cap doesn't want to play ball. So the NFL feels like, in a way, I bet they feel like they win because then Cap showed them that, to your point, you know, I am, I'm still grinding this ax. And I don't blame him for grinding the ax, but I worry now that he's not going to be back in the league. And that that's a shame. Yeah, I think he clinched it. I think what he did this weekend means he's never going to have a gig. Well, again. I want I, it's to me. I, I want to make sure because I don't. I don't agree. It's about what he. It is. It's about what he did, but it's really the NFL made this mess. There's we can't lose sight of that. I mean, like, I do not blame him for moving the workout. I don't blame him for asking for the waiver to be changed. I don't ask. I don't blame him for having cameras in there. I'd be paranoid too if somebody took your employment for three years. And you didn't trust anybody. Wouldn't you want your own cameras in there? I get that stuff. But you also, at the end of the day, gave them the game. If they were playing a game and that's what they wanted, which is what pro cap people insist, is the NFL has been playing a game and this was their desired outcome, he gave them the desired outcome. Yeah, you know, in the beginning, like I said, going back to the week, I'm like, look, even if you don't like Kaepernick, you have to take his side and that this is... Like, why couldn't this have been worked out? Why couldn't it have been on a better day? Why couldn't it have been something where everybody was on the same page? But then I didn't know what to believe anymore, Chris, because then I read, oh, no, he wanted his reps there and he wanted his camera crew. And you're like, okay. But then then Nike was there and then Nike denied it. So you and I, like, you caught me on that one. You were like, hey, dude, I think that Nike thing may not even be true when we were talking this weekend. So then I'm like, all right, let me double check that. So I was like, all right, I guess that isn't true. So then you're thinking like, what is this whole deal? But the the thing that, that I guess bothered me the most was that, it sucks he doesn't have a job, and even if you disagree with what he did, he should still, in this country, be able to play football. I do think, based on talks I've had with people going back when this thing all started, I think that he and his agent, and I don't know that any, I wonder what people have said, because they said, like, we'll take any job, we'll do whatever. That's not what it was in the beginning. Dude wanted starter money. He wanted starter well, money. Well, and, okay? and he was right to want starter money. That's in the fine. Beginning. Yeah, here, you can ask for here, whatever you want. But here's here, here's the deal, though. 12 uh, 16 touchdowns, four interceptions, bottom third quarterback in pretty much everything. And by bottom third, we're like talking about the upper tier of the bottom third. And guess what? When people point that out, thinking they're winning the argument, well, he was a bottom third quarterback. Is like, how many bottom third starting quarterbacks just lose their jobs forever, especially two years removed from a Super Bowl? You know, the only year he played really bad was the one year before 16. He was bad. And if he had repeated that a second year, I would have said, okay, well, it makes sense. He's not, he's having trouble getting jobs, but you know, people that, that write him off the Super Bowl year, that it was a, a, it was a defensive, you know, performance that propelled them to the Super Bowl because they had all these names. Look at the points they yielded in the playoffs. Look at the Green Bay game. Anybody who's, who has common sense. I mean, and I get the thing where he wanted starter money. Here's what we should do going forward. And people would say, this is, this is not, you know, this is not done. This is unprecedented. The league needs to make it public how they're negotiating, what they're offering. If a team claims they have interest, put it out there to the public. I don't understand why we're not doing this in public now because this is the single most important free agency situation in NFL history. It is. But here's the thing at the end. And, and of all these debates, like I was watching TV this morning and they were like, oh, it's a waiver. And then some guy was arguing like, he, you know, what, what man would ever sign this waiver and give his life rights away? And you're like, they're not taking your house and car, okay? It's a waiver against injury. And, you know, from what I saw, it, it looked pretty standard. But then people don't even want to believe that that's standard. All I'm saying is that at the very end, when he gets up there and he says, stop running, don't be scared, and like goes at him. And I get being pissed off, okay? I get it. If I were him, I'd be furious about this. But a lot of times in life, we have a situation when it comes to employment where we don't get to say that thing. Yeah. You know, that's like we don't get to say that thing. We have to follow whatever rules there are that we don't like. And you're going to have to meet with people that you don't like. You know how many meetings I've had to take with certain people and like, oh, this guy runs this thing or this is this is all these different. And and you just you go in with the attitude of present the best version of yourself. So that you make it hard on them to say no to you, you know, play yeah, here, the game. And if you wanted a job again, 
I, I, I think at the end of it, he proved that I'm like, oh, okay, so you're going to do this? Well, you're going to, I, I would, I would push back though, because I'm just saying like the way I, the best analogy I can think of is that somebody gets in a marital spat and they get cheated on by their spouse. And then a year later, the spouse is like, hey, let's, let's, let's have dinner and get back together. And you blow up about it. You haven't even talked about it. Like this is the first time you guys have talked about it. You know, not that you'd be going back out to dinner with your spouse that cheated on you, but say you were trying to make it work and you blew up at dinner a little bit and then everybody turns it into, well, the reason this isn't working is because you blew up at dinner. No, the reason this isn't working is because half the, half the people involved in this thing created this mess. And like, that's my thing is, yeah, it's relevant that like, I haven't agreed with cap on every tactical turn in the road for him. But the reason we're in this situation where he's under the duress, where he has to make PR moves and some people could say he failed at it. You know, he let his spike get the best of him and he gave him the game. But we're in this situation because of the NFL. So, you know, I, I, I cannot imagine you, you likened it to an employment situation. Regular people have to do this on a regular basis. And there's plenty of people to get their employment status fucked over based on a number of factors. But this is a very visible situation that's flammable. And, uh, and they took his job based on his ideology. They, nothing else. For some, for some teams, I guess it's distraction. But it I, I don't know how. I mean, it's, I don't it, know. It, it's not some. Every team he would go on. This is like, this is a stupid workout. And this was a. No. Yeah, no. I hear, I hear you on that. It was a stupid workout and this, that, and the third. And it was, it was a test where he had to jump through hoops. But you think a guy that took a knee knowingly, knowing that he's putting himself in danger and his employment status is probably going to change over it is going to go against his value system the principle of of doing a workout on a three-day notice like he's already said i've i've laid the gauntlet down on my employment my ideology my safety you know my public the court of public opinion i've just said fuck it no i get exactly what you're saying If if the guy's willing to put everything on the line then he wasn't going to do the thing well then it's like okay fine so if you're going to be the guy that's defiant then don't start asking why you don't have a job is my well, point. Like if I you're going to be disagree. defined at the end and say the whole league is running, stop being scared, I'm ready to go, um, then it's like, oh, okay, well, now you can stop asking why you don't have a job. Cause well, the- I mean, <laughs> but we're only three days into the, this chapter of him not having a job. We're, we're a couple years removed from his last snap. No, so, no I doubt. Mean, yeah. Well, I guess I'm just yeah. saying like from now moving forward. Um, all right, we no, got. And bunch- I don't. I, yeah, I don't disagree with all. His, I don't agree with all his tactics all the time. But that's the key. Is like, and we've lost the sense of nuance. Even if we agree that we're pro cap, you know, it is really a slippery slope. You have one nuance difference in your in your assessment of the situation, and you can be voted off the island. So I am kind of not going to talk about cap unless I have to. I still am pro cap. I'm excited about the prospect of him being back in the league, but I don't see it happening after what ha- happened this weekend. Okay, more to do, including Nick Cage. My friends over at DraftKings, these guys get it. They've launched an online sports book created by sports fans for sports fans. Here's real good news if you live in Pennsylvania. It's now available for you in your state. And trust me, DraftKings is hard at work bringing their sportsbook app, which happens to be America's top-rated sportsbook app, everywhere. The DraftKings sportsbook app has it all over, unders. Also, player props, in-game betting, and special odds boost every day for the biggest games. This isn't some offshore operation like other gambling sites. It's a legitimate sports book based right here in the U.S. So you can rest assured that your funds are totally secure. DraftKings, the leader in daily fantasy sports, has brought their expertise to legal sports betting. Get in on the action wherever, whenever, in the Keystone State. Download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app right now and use code RUSSILLO, R-U-S-S-I-L-L-O, when you sign up. For a limited time, all new and existing users can get a deposit bonus up to $500. That's code Rosillo to get a deposit bonus up to $500. Only a DraftKings Sportsbook must be 21 or older. Pennsylvania only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. Deposit bonus requires 25-time playthrough. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. The new Razor's coming out. I didn't even know this. Yeah. Did you, you obviously rocked a Razor, what, back in uh, college? I mean, in college, I, I was just into the BlackBerry phase. Oh, and so did you ever have a razor? Oh, yeah. I had like the the clap, like, you know, you close it. It was like one of those movie set chalk sticks or whatever they do. Um, yeah, I uh, 
I love the flip phone. And in fact, recently I bought one trying to get rid of this iPhone mental poison. I mean, it's just, we, the new iPhone commercial creeps me out so much. Like the guy opening his eyes and he's like, I got to have my phone. Like the entire thing is scary. Like we basically become our iPhone. So I tried to go get a flip phone last year. It lasted like a week. I wanted to get on Instagram or one of the apps. It's hard, man. I hate it. I, I realized the other day, I think I watched cooking videos for an hour while I was on the couch the other day. And I usually set limits like timers will be like, Hey, you've been on this app for an hour. You know, Twitter, I'll be like, all right, I can, I only need an hour today, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, only an hour of poison. Yeah. And I, I'm realizing I hate it a lot, but this razor is going to have, it's, it's a touchscreen. It's got all sorts of stuff going on. So I don't really, it's not solving any kind of problem. Um, but I, I remember working with Scott and thinking, man, like Van Pelt is on his phone so much. And the funny thing too, was like all the talk show hosts, Cowherd didn't care. That's what makes Cowherd really good. But every other talk show host I've ever worked with, some guys would have the tweet deck open during the segments. Guys were mm-hmm. tweeting while, like imagine reading tweets and you're actually hosting a radio show. And like yeah, guys were doing, hard. what's that? It seems hard to like, you know, shift your focus and then shift it back and not sound yeah, like an idiot. But like, this is a very niche thing, but like think how incredibly stupid it is as a talk show host as soon as you go to commercial break. And for a radio show, normal radio show, you know, our segments were like eight to nine minutes, seven, eight, sometimes commercial breaks, like seven, seven and a half, six and a half, something like that. And you've got four breaks. You're talking like 12 times. So 12 times over the three hour radio show, as soon as you get done with the segment, you immediately go to your phone and see what people said about your segment. Yeah, that, it's, that's, that's, it's nuts. And I, I was like, why am I doing this? And then I stopped doing it. I put my phone in the studio, in the producer studio. Cause I was like, I don't want to deal with this. But now now it's like this thing where I don't even host a radio show and I'm looking at Instagram cooking videos. By the way, Europeans suck at cooking eggs. You burn the shit out of them. Um, just be better with your eggs. Be if better. You're scramble them. Scramble. Like you just crack eggs open and burn the hell out of them. I'm very fussy when it comes to scrambled eggs. I'm, I'm probably the best person you'll ever Olive meet. Olive oil. Olive oil. No, nah, a little milk. I'm a little milk and I oh, keep no, the air no, in no. it all the time. And it's, there's no white. There's no brown. There's no. It is all just clouds of bill- billowing clouds of egg. I don't like that, mo- like the moist, uh, billowing eggs. I like, you know, I like a little moist. bit on the, a little on the crispier side, Ugh, olive oil. Jesus. Um, and I also, I also, all right, don't call me crazy. I eat my eggs with a spoon. Um, not the craziest thing. It actually doesn't surprise me. How did that start? And how come it never stopped? Well, it, it it never stopped because, you know, eggs are hard to wrangle with a fork sometimes. Like, how do you get the end of your eggs? Like, when you get down to the end of it, like, and there's just a couple little pieces, like, what do you do? You just make a bunch of noise and you're stabbing your plate. <laughs> Everybody looks at you. Well, some people will tell you that's what the last piece of toast is for. What if you don't eat toast? Gluten-free. Well, you could do... I don't know if this is this is right, but like if there's ever like a salad where it's got the last it's the last bite, I'm not yeah. afraid of putting my thumb at the edge of the plate <laughs> and, and to, to, yeah to like to trap it. it in there. Yeah, like I don't. It. I wouldn't eat the whole. I'm not a. I'm not an alien. Just you know what I mean? Like I wouldn't with, eat my eggs home. with a spoon. Eggs with a spoon. Just try it. All right, I'm gonna give it a shot. I may get some eggs after the show today. So, look out, world. Spoon, spoon it, bro. Hey, what's going on with Nick Cage? Nicholas Cage is starring in a movie about himself, and that's music to my ears. I am a huge Nick Nick Cage fan. Are you a Nick Nick Cage fan? You know, I do. Uh, I like him. I, Adaptation is one of my favorite movies ever made, and he's so freaking good in it. And I think that's how we should look at actors. It'd be great if we did that with players. Like if you just like Joe Flacco's Nick Cage. Yeah, right? it's his best moment. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, I just came up with that. Yeah, it, I like that. That's almost a, that's a segment next week, maybe. Let's do that. Let's do that next um, week. But with Nick Cage, you know, everything about him, like the divorce rate is prolific. Um, wait, wait, in real life? How, how divorced is he? Many. Do you have the number? Do I have to look this I don't, up now? I don't have the number, but the, the kicker is four, four. But the kicker is <laughs> that he was married for like four days in Vegas. Like he got married in Vegas, like on a whim. And then- there were some cir- some circumstances around this marriage of why he had to terminate it. I think infidelity. I don't want to 
I don't want to make shit up, but I remember there was something like he didn't know something about the woman he was marrying. Well, uh, you think you're getting married in Vegas. How well do you know her? Um, and then he has a 10 foot tomb for himself that he built in new Orleans. Have you seen his pyramid tomb? I've heard about it from my new Orleans people. Yeah. So it's like 10 feet, obviously no body in it yet, but, um, he, he plans on being buried in that giant fucking tomb. And another thing he did was he bought a, um, a T-Rex skull for $270,000 out of Mongolia, out of the black market. But it turned out that it was stolen. So he had to give it back. Is that the most Nick Cage thing? Is it art imitating reality or reality imitating art? You're really into Nick Cage. I don't think I knew this. Well, another thing about Nick Cage is that, <laughs> it's that he bought the most haunted mansion in the U.S., in Louisiana, and then it got fucking repoed. You know, like what a Nick Cage move to just buy a haunted mansion and, and and you lose it in foreclosure. I mean, everything he does, it's on brand. And that's what I appreciate about him. Apparently 15 houses, uh, Vegas, California, uh, a deserted island in the Bahamas. Yep. Got to have that. Right. Um, I have a nine foot tall burial tomb. No, who, who's to say? Yeah. Who's to say? <laughs> it's the, it's not about it's not about comparing no it isn't he's got an octopus a shrunken pygmy head collection a yeah, hundred and fifty thousand dollars superman comic which is maybe an investment a 70 million year old dinosaur skull people are putting that number at a lot higher by the way for the dinosaur skull well um, he bought it he bought it for like 270 is what i heard oh so he blew he blew through 150 million at one point like that's what i would just love to know like does he have a buddy does he have a guy or does everybody just like with nick cage it's just you only know him on the periphery no i if he has a guy he's not doing a very good job <laughs> do you think you'd ever I, deep down want to be that weird like sometimes listen, i wonder like what if you just go that road and you're like in a weird way then everything you do becomes sort of accepted because you're like, oh, no, just it, yeah, you can you can do erratic shit. And people are just like, ah, oh, it's no big deal right now. If I did some erratic shit, like for the most part, people are like, are you OK? Like we need to talk. But like Nick Cage, you can do whatever. It's kind of, you know, uh, anything goes. And I would just say this. If Nick Cage is 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 listening, I will be your guy. Like if you need me, I will be there, bro. Like, let me do a two week audition as your guy. I'll pay for my own travel, my own lodging. I, I think we can write this ship. Uh, well, you're going to see the movie, though. Oh, for sure. Is it going to be drama? What if it was a comedy? It's a little bit of everything, and that's what it really Cage's is. life is all about. What's the movie with him? What was the movie with him in... Uh, I used to work at a, a music store when I was in high school and then a couple years into college, right? So vinyl that's flex. My, yeah, 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 yeah. CDs though. And that's where my great jazz knowledge comes from because mm. it just I went, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to start at Porgy and Bess and just keep going. And um, I would just, you know, I'd be in there. Some days were slow. We start opening up. <laughs> Some CD. days were slow. <laughs> Some days vineyard winner, CD guy. Yeah, yeah, people aren't exactly buying a lot of vinyls. I'm sure Bon Jovi was a good seller up there. He was. Bill I think Belichick my loves Bon Jovi. My favorite story from the music store days was Carly Simon showed up because she lives on the vineyard, and uh, she walked in and she was like, "Where's there's the new releases?" And there was like only ten slots for the new releases in the featured area, right? And uh, she was like, "Where, where's my CD?" And I was like, well, "What do you mean? Like it's been out for three weeks? Like it's not a new release anymore?" She's like, "That's the." <laughs> It's like, that's the criteria. And I'm like, yeah, that's, this is what it is. Like, I don't know what to tell you. And then she goes over to her section and we only had like two or three of hers in our, the catalog. And then she went over to check James Taylor's section and it was like 20 deep. Wow. Yeah. And she got Hold on so, a second. Carly Simon, jog my memory. You're so vain. Yeah. I mean, like, I know the name. Not She was married to you. James Taylor is the point. Also. Okay. Yeah. And look, gotcha. I'm not, I'm not like trying to call anybody out here, but she, she wanted to see what JT's situation was and the depth of his catalog was, was better. And then 
I think she started yelling at like the other guy that worked there. And she was, you know, she's like, well, this is ridiculous. She's like, I, this is my home. I live here. And you only have like the greatest can you, hits and the new can one. Can you imagine if I came into a trading card store, do they still have those? And was like, where's my rookie card? And just like flipped over a desk and there's cards flying everywhere. Like that would be the equivalent. I'm not saying that she was erratic, but you don't go into a music store and demand to see, you know, your catalog. By the way, before we're off the Nick Cage thing, go to YouTube and look up Nicolas Cage losing his shit. Not you, but the listeners out there. It's about a three-minute video, but it'll be the best three minutes of your life. Well done. Well done. Okay, let's talk Chris Longbowl. New England beats Philadelphia 17-10. Tight game. Your boy Edelman throws a touchdown pass. Uh, What do we make of these teams right now? Well, I mean, I think the entire takeaway for Philly fans is predicated on what you think of New England. If you think New England is the Super Bowl contending team, which I think they're a, con- a Super Bowl contending team. You sound down on um, them right now, though. It sounds like you're you're a little off them. Well, you worry about the offense. You do. I mean, like, how could you not? Um, and you worry about stopping the run. I, the Eagles went away from a little bit. They were down Jordan Howard. I think if you look at it that way, it's not the worst loss the Eagles have had all season, but of course it's the biggest loss because it's the latest and now they're 500. And this was like, they put themselves in a position where losses to Atlanta and Detroit and teams like that have mounted up and made this a must win. And of course in the NFC East, nothing's truly a must win, but we mentioned the Eagles struggles with Dallas earlier. Everybody has to oversimplify things and make it a Wentz thing. And I just got, I actually got a, a tweet from um, a guy earlier one of the listeners, definitely from Boston, like, oh, is Chris going to cancel the pod, Ryan, at Ryan, at Chris, because he doesn't want to, you know, take the Eagles offense to task? The, the offense was bad, dude. Carson yeah, didn't play take great. Take that. Take that. No, but, like, that. Carson did, Carson didn't play great. Like, but guess what? You've been touting this Patriots defense all year as the best of all time or in that, in that and we they've come down to earth a bit. But you got to pick one. Because Carson not having a perfect game against these guys with down the starting running back, down Deshaun Jackson, down Alshon Jeffrey, down both tackles at one point in the game. By by the way, when Lane Johnson leaves early, that's a big deal. Carson was pressured 22 out of 48 snaps. Again, he holds the ball long too, too long sometimes. So that stat, his snap to release is relevant. The longer you hold it, the more you're going to get pressured. But he had four incompletions in a row on that final drive. I didn't think he had an egregiously bad game, but it was funny to me that in a game where the GOAT, who's still a really good player, was all over the place the first half. He set an, a record for incompletions in a half. It's the first game he played an entire game, didn't leave, lead the Patriots in touchdown passes. Shout out to Jules. Um, I, I just think, like, are we going to be mad at Brady too? I, I know Wentz isn't the GOAT and he doesn't get that kind of slack, but that's a team who offensively has to hurry up and figure some things out for the for the level of expectation in New England to be met. And, of course, R- Romo, who I love, every time Brady missed a throw, it was the wind. <laughs> every time Wentz missed a throw, it was like he missed another one there. And, and if this is the game you're going to give up on Wentz over, first off, if you're giving up on Wentz, like as if franchise quarterbacks grow on trees, I think you're, you're, you're short-sighted. Second, this is not the game. Like, he didn't play that well, but, bro, that's the best defense in the league, most people think, right? That's what people think at this point. Um, yeah, they were San Francisco, you know. Um, San Francisco, but, the team that but, gave up 50 points to, I mean, DVOA, man, doesn't sound like a real exact science the way I'm looking at it now because DVOA was telling me these guys were both the 2,000 Ravens. Yeah, no, they are. And, I mean, going into the week, they still were, were – way ahead of everybody else i mean i was i was looking at the numbers this morning they don't get updated um until you know the monday nighter so we'll know more about And you're right i mean it's san francisco who in what last couple of weeks were going oh wait a minute what what happened to these guys on defense so i'm not going to sit there and say that all of a sudden like i still you know i've always said i've liked their personnel better than new england's but new england's one you know holding a team down to 10 after they gave up a bunch of yards to lamar and those guys so i, I think the brady thing it, it continues to be this thing that's real his first half second half stuff it just felt like yesterday was just a grind. You know what I mean? It was a grind for like, everybody. Like, you know what I mean? But you know how, like, if you have a, a buddy and, and you seem like walking somewhere and you're like, what is wrong? Like, just uh, just having a bad day. Yeah, just arduous. As soon as I got out of the house, everything was a challenge. And it just felt like the Brady and his movements 
and maybe I'm doing too much here, and maybe, but I don't think I am. I think I'm right here. I, I really, the, the more I watch him this year, the more I think things just feel more challenging. And I don't know if it's just because of the offensive line. I don't know if it's because of no Gronk. You know, it could be all of these things collectively, but I think even the biggest Patriots fan has to admit in some private moment that, you know, maybe this is what it looks like for the end of Tom. And then, you know, as soon as I say that out loud, he goes and probably wins another Super Bowl. No, so who knows? I'm not willing to do that because I'm not going to be the guy. What I'm saying is, though, that, and I'll pose this as a question to you. I mean, you're 42, 43 years old. You're going to have bad days where the ball's not, you know, just zipping off your arm, uh, you know, outside the hashes. It, Brady, Brady is still going to have them in a position to compete for the whole thing at the end of the year. Even with the lack of Gronk, with the lack of Devlin, with the O-line problems, with some of the drops he had yesterday. But I would ask you this. The Eagles secondary has been much maligned. The Patriots defense has been called one of the best ever. Right. So no, why, are we, why are we sitting here talking about, and Tom didn't have a great game. You know who had about the same game as Tom? Carson. They both, they both had bad throws. But we're sitting here, and I know that the GOAT gets a lot more leash because he is the GOAT, and he's going to have his team where they need to be. And I'm a huge Tom fan, so don't don't mistake this as a Tom critique. But people have not great days, and Tom would tell you that. Carson had a not great day against one of the best defenses of all time. And if you look at these two, these two offenses, they've both fallen off a lot since that Super Bowl year. I think the Eagles missed Frank Wright. I think they, they missed DeFilippo. I think they had a lot of injuries. But the Pats have a lot of injuries, and they've fallen off a lot since that Super Bowl. Our defense in 17 was much better than the – not much better, but it was better than the Eagles' defense right now. We have more pieces. They put up 600-plus yards offensively on us. Yesterday was, like you said, a struggle. And so I think there's concerns for both offenses here. One obviously has a much better cushion and a defense that's going to keep them in every game. Okay, we're going to do a little movie review on the podcast today. We do it um, all. Yeah, we're going to do um, Brewster's Millions. Do you remember? I'm going to go ahead. I'm going <laughs> to read, do this read. Do you remember the first movie you were allowed to watch that was like an older movie, like an older person movie? Because I remember. I just It just popped in my head. So think of that answer while I yeah. read this from Kendra Scott Jewelers. Looking for some sparkle under the tree? Finding the perfect gift for everyone on your list can be a difficult task, but it doesn't have to be. Kendra Scott is here to help make your shopping this season as easy as possible with a great selection of gifts for everyone on your list. From a classic pendant necklace to an on-trend statement earring ooh, or something customized, they've got pieces for every style and budget, including hundreds of styles, under $100. Best of all, Kendra Scott offers free shipping plus free gift wrapping and free returns. Just in case, want some personal shopping advice? Visit your local Kendra Scott store and they will help you find the right jewelry for you and your loved ones or go to their website and take their perfect gift finder quiz um i can't wait to get one of those earrings are you in on that do you want one of those i'm totally in on that just one earring though yeah but it's going to be an on-trend statement earring and guys are going to walk by us going hey those earrings are both on trend and maybe making any kind of statement um <laughs> and our gift to you visit KendraScott.com. Use the promo code Ryan Rosillo. That's R Y E N R U S S I L L O. Or mention this ad in your local Kendra Scott store for twenty dollars off your next purchase. How about that? You can just go to Kendra Scott and be like, "Hey, I was listening to Chris Long and Rosillo talk about Nick Cage. Where's my twenty percent off?" Boom, done. Mm. Hurry, Boom. this is a limited time offer. All right, because we don't want these places to get just overrun with listeners. But if you want to go ahead and do mm -hmm. that, that's okay too. That's twenty percent off at KendraScott.com. Use the code Ryan Rosillo. Joker, go. Yeah, Joker, not as good as, uh, the movie's not as good as Joaquin Phoenix's performance. I'll just say that. Yeah, he's awesome. Was, was he the, the movie goat? awesome? Uh, I liked the movie. I enjoyed it a lot. You did not. Uh, no, I enjoyed it, but I didn't enjoy it like, like I was, I was maybe it was a victim of the buildup and you the were. hype. But the, a mic, no, I, I think ob objectively, I wouldn't have liked it even. Listen, I'll give it like a eight out of ten, seven and a half out of ten. That's pretty good. Yeah. No, I'm just saying it's it's not a seven and a half, seven and a half. I'll give it a seven and a half. Maybe no, you know what? Maybe it's a six and a half. Because what you, just happened? Okay, you you just but the you problem just is a, you're a, an eight and a six and a half is like the Panama Canal. 
It's massive. Well, you know what I had to I had to realize that there's very few nines and tens. So I I was like, and by nine and uh, an eight or a nine is a great movie. So let me put that at a six and a half. It was a good movie. It lacked it lacked supporting characters that I was really into. Um, one of them turned out to be not even real. In, in his his pseudo girlfriend, um, the this the scene on the steps really had seen this for about a month now. A lot of build up, jock jams, bro. <laughs> You've got Joaquin Phoenix acting like a fucking. I I can't. I don't know. Can I say psychopath? I'm okay with it. Insensitive to psychopaths, but he's acting very believably like he's completely unhinged. And you've got this iconic scene and you, and you roll the same CD on the soundtrack that I used to listen to in JV baseball. Like (laughs) I will, I will admit I didn't understand. What is that? Gary glitter? Man, I don't even, fuck, it was, it was a letdown, that one. And listen, he was wonderful. Uh, I, th- I still think in comparing him to Heath Ledger, I mean, the movie was better when Heath was in it. Um, and Heath did more of like the comic book villain thing. Whereas Joaquin did this like very believable in a scary way. Yeah, he, villain, uh, real he life villain. Heavy cardio, by the way. Would you go outside if that's what your body looked like? No, because I'd be cold. It's just my bones. That was like machinist in Dallas Buyers Club level. Yeah, he was he was big time machinist. I was I was worried about him in that one. All right, so that was I think the craziest movie review ever. You, what, you, what, flirt, what, what? you flirted with an eight, and then you gave it a six and a half. That's well, a bad scene. I, I, the the, the, the I Jack Jam thing. For a good call. What's that? I don't, I don't do this for a living. What's what, what did you give it? I don't know. Eight. I liked it. I enjoyed the movie. I thought it was a good movie. Now, Adnan came on and crushed it, which I knew he was going to do. But he also pointed out some stuff that more of our cinephiles out there would um, would understand in that. What did he it, point out? Well, he said the whole thing was stolen. It wasn't a nod to this other movie. He was like, it was completely stolen from this other movie like 30 years ago. And I forgot the name of the movie. Oh, wow. So if I were super into movies and maybe saw that, then maybe I would... Here's what I do with movies now. And the expectation thing screws up everything. Some of the best movies, I didn't know what The Usual Suspects was about at all. I saw the poster. I liked the guys in the movie. And I had an afternoon to myself. And I walked in and watched the movie. And because of that, I always loved The Usual Suspects. Okay, I loved it, loved it, loved it. Because I, I didn't know anything about it when I went to go see it. Again, a couple hours of kill. Kind of weird that I did it that way. Went ahead and did it. The buildup for Joker is at a point now, if you're seeing it today not last month, if you're seeing it now, I, you know, you're probably going to end up being disappointed. I sat down in the theater, had some popcorn, Solo, obviously, watched it, enjoyed it, left. Solo, obviously. Solo, obviously. Man, that is a downer. We can't end on that, can we? No, oh, I don't care. Oh, that stuff? Come on, dude. I don't, come on. No, I, I, I like going to the movies solo. I actually like going to dinner solo. I did it the other night. My wife was out of town. She was like, you're not going alone, are you? I'm like, yeah, I love it. I, I don't like understand I don't... people that can't. Like, I, I know friends that are like, well, how do you do this? I'm like, if I didn't go out to dinner solo, I, I'd starve. I'd rather just eat by myself than, like, be at a big dinner full of a bunch of people. I'd rather sit at a bar, eat dinner at the bar. I love, back in the day, reading the newspaper, highlighter out, sitting at the bar, salad, maybe Watch, even watching Watching I Love Lucy at night, which was airing live when you were a kid. <laughs> what was the movie that you were allowed to watch? What was the first one? Because the reason I brought it up is it was on the other day. I was at a friend's house, and my friend's mom had to call my mom to ask if it was okay for me to watch Stripes. Okay, for me, it was Howard the Duck. I mean, like, it wasn't a terribly, like, vulgar or, from what I remember, it was just a movie that a five-year-old or whatever, a six-year-old's not supposed to be watching. I also watched a lot of Arnold movies early. I think probably earlier than I should have been. Yeah, but that's just, that seems right for the long family to get their kids into Arnold movies early. Yeah, it does, right? Yeah, that just seems. Dad's got a flat top. I think the duck tricked a lot of people. Well, you know, Howard say, the Duck? Yeah, they just say, oh, it's a duck. It's going to be good for kids. You're like, no, it's not really that. You know, What was the movie really about? I don't know. I remember even as a kid being like, I don't think I like this. <laughs> but I'm watching it repeatedly for whatever reason. We have it on VHS. Yeah, And it VHS. intrigued me. 
Okay, uh, that's our podcast. Check out, give uh, give people all the love for Chalk Media here. Chalk Media, Chalk Media, Chalk Media. Uh, you know, we've got a pod. It's called Greenlight. Uh, I do it twice a week, so check that out. Uh, you know, it's on Spotify, iTunes, all that stuff. And then uh, we have a show called Fishbowl as well, and that is a series of interviews. This week, I had one that was a Ryan Rosillo special coming out Saturday. That was a – you hooked me up with Miles Teller. You did, and yeah, he, uh, uh, he was decked out. He was at the Eagles game the other day. Oh, yesterday he was at he was at the Eagles game yesterday. I know he was disappointed, but uh, we had a good interview coming out this weekend. We casted the um, the the you know the movie that's inevitably going to come out about two seven two thousand seventeen Eagles. We casted everybody. We talked about Top Gun, all that shit. So check out, check us out at Chalk Media YouTube, and uh, you know listen to the pod if you're so inclined. Green All right. Sounds good. Please also subscribe to this podcast and we will be back. I'll be back Wednesday, Friday, obviously, for my podcast. And we'll be back with Chris next Monday.